Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Austin, and I'm the Director of Alumni and Community Relations at Colby Sawyer College. It's great to see so many alumni, students, faculty, staff, parents, and friends online with us today for the second session of our alumni speaker series. Today, I'm really pleased to welcome Lisa Hogarty, class of 1981. Lisa currently serves as Vice President of Real Estate Planning and Development at Boston Children's Hospital. She has served on the Colby Sawyer Board of Trustees since 2016, and she was elected chair of the board in 2020. Uh, before we hear from Lisa, just a couple of announcements and reminders. We are recording today's session and we will share a link to it with you in the coming days. Because we are using the webinar format, the cameras and microphones for all of you in our audience are turned off. But please enjoy the conversation and feel free to use the chat or the Q&A functions to pose questions throughout the presentation. We'll monitor all of your questions and we'll get to many, as many of those as possible before the end. As a reminder, the chat and Q&A functions can be found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Simply move your cursor or touch your mobile device and those icons should become visible. So now I'm pleased to turn the screen over to Dan Parrish, Vice President for College Advancement, who will be moderating today's program. Great, thanks so much, Tracy. And thanks to all of you who've joined us. It's really great I'm watching the attendees enter the room here and it's great to see a lot of familiar names, uh, alumni from all over the place and some local neighbors here and some folks here on campus. So thank you again for joining us and many thanks to Lisa Hogarty for being our second guest in the alumni speaker series. We're very excited to have her with us today. So um, we'll get right into the conversation after a very short introduction. As Tracy mentioned, Lisa earned her BFA in theater in 1981 here at Colby Sawyer College. She also holds a master's degree in economic development and tourism from NYU. Since 2016, Lisa has served as the vice president of real estate and planning at Boston Children's Hospital where she is responsible for a 3 billion, that's B, B not M, 3 billion 10 year capital plan. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through our conversation. Before she came to Children's Hospital, Lisa worked in senior leadership positions at Dartmouth College, Harvard University, and the Columbia University Medical Center. And there's lots of other things before that, but we'll, we'll stop there for now. She may mention some of the other pieces. Lisa was elected to the Colby Sawyer Board of Trustees in 2016, and we hope to talk a little bit about her role as a trustee. Uh, she became chair of the Board of Trustees last year and is finishing up her first year in that role. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit too. Um, but Lisa, let's start, we, right before we came on, we were talking a little bit about this. So let's start um, with Colby Sawyer and how you landed here from Hawaii, which, just is a long way to come. So tell us a little bit about that and, and just how this, how you, how you came here. Uh, well, thanks, Dan. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, hi to everybody out there. Um, so I was born and raised in Hawaii, um, but both my parents were from the East Coast. My dad from Princeton, New Jersey, and my mom from Andover, Massachusetts. And uh, they sort of started drumming it into us uh, probably around age four that you will go to college on the East Coast. So um, that, that's all I ever focused on. And uh, one of my cousins, Susie Hogarty, who I think is class of 1980, uh, was at Colby Sawyer. And um, I found out about the theater program um, and uh, so applied and, and uh, came in the fall of 1978. Great. You, um, you, let, you let slip earlier that you were totally unprepared for temperatures below 65 or 70 and, and weather. Um, did, you, did you say that it was the blizzard of 78 or it was very close? It was, one of, it was just a, an yeah. incredible year for weather your first year. It was. Um, yeah. So I didn't have a coat and I didn't have boots and I w had slippers and shorts. And um, I remember the registrar said to me, I was like, is it always this cold? And she said, yeah, I think we had our summer on a on a Tuesday this year. So, um, I, you know, that was sort of startling to me. And and I remember it, and the winter was brutal and, you know, you, the snow blowers could barely, you know, carve a yeah. path. But, the last snow, the last snow was like the first week in May, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, how am I going to ever survive?" <laughs> but it was uh, good indoctrination, and I, you know, I, I, I uh, 
fully enjoy being a New Englander now. Yeah, that's great. Tell, tell me a little bit about your time in the theater. I, um, you've told me a little bit about this before, but you spent, a, I mean, you majored in theater, but, but it sounds like that was really a home for you. And you spent a lot of time in yeah. the theater while you were here at Colby Sawyer. Yeah, my work study job uh, was actually as the house manager. So, um, and it was uh, the presidential campaigns uh, for 1980. So beginning oh, in 79, wow. we had, you know, Ronald Reagan a couple of times, Jimmy Carter, um, Ted Kennedy, who was running against Jimmy Carter in the primary, uh, even Al Gore, who was probably like 18. <laughs> um, he had thrown his hat in the ring, George, uh, the first Bush, so it was super busy, um, but, you know, and the theater program was um, so active. The dance program was so active. So uh, I, yeah, I really lived in that building. It was fantastic. That's great. That uh, being in that house manager position, um, I, I imagine at 19, 20 years old, you were put in some uh, moments where you had to make some really hard decisions or just had to tell people who were much older than you to behave better than they were? Yes. Yes. I, I started doing that with my parents when I was five. So I had really good practice. Um, yeah. You know, I think um, one of the, one of the things that I learned the most was how to think on my feet and um, you know, and, and really just deal with the issue in the moment and uh, you know, but try to be as gracious and calm as possible. And, um, you know, that sort of suited me through my entire career. That's great. Are there, um, beyond the theater, you know, what other things, I mean, you, you're back here a lot now, but there was a period of time where you weren't coming to campus and, um, you know, what, what stayed with you um, beyond the time in the theater, either, either in individual experiences in classes or things you did with your friends or just I don't know, getting off campus and going to Buckland Beach or whatever it might have been, what what stayed with you? Yeah, I, I just I just always thought New London was just so beautiful, you know, and, and that's coming from Hawaii, which, you know, it's certainly a different contrast, but um, I, I just always found it, you know, the beauty was just, you know, everywhere you looked and the campus was you know, well kept and and uh, and it was manageable. You know, um, it, you know, having worked at these other places now, um, you know, at least you knew all the names of the buildings and it was easy yeah. to get to class. Um, but but I just love the environment and um, you know and and uh, I I even tried skiing without having lessons and that didn't go so well. But it it still was fun. <laughs> Besides taking lessons, are there other pieces of advice you would have given your college self at different points in, in time in terms of what you did here, what you passed up? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I graduated in three years uh, with my bachelor's. So, um, you know, uh, hindsight being what it is, you know, maybe I, I shouldn't have rushed so much. Mm -hmm. um, I just was really excited to move to New York City which I did when I was 20. And, yeah. um, but uh, yeah, I probably would have said, you know, slow down just a little bit. Um, so yeah, how, I, still how, I still tell myself to slow down. To slow <laughs> I, well, I'm guessing that you're not very successful in taking that advice, but we'll, we can keep talking through that. Um, how did you, when how, you, when you left here to go to New York, you left to take a job on Broadway and to, to work in the theater. Um, you were here three years, you were working really hard, you were moving really quick. How did that come together for you? Well, uh, the truth is nepotism. Um, <laughs> and so my dad's best friend in the army uh, is a gentleman named Emmanuel Eisenberg, uh, who is a very, very, very successful producer. Yeah. So he said, he said to me, before I give you a real Broadway job, you have to, you have to hustle twice as hard as, as anybody else. So I, I, was able to do some stage managing off Broadway and off off Broadway. I answered phones in his office. I was, you know, sort of the, the, the messenger girl, you know, running to the bank, running to the box offices. So um, it was great training and, and he saw I was serious. And so I got my first Broadway show when I was 21 as a stage manager for Master Harold and the Boys with James Earl Jones. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, me and that Jennifer is... Holiday, we were we we were both 21 years old. She won a Tony Award for Dream Girls and and I yeah. got to work with James Earl Jones. So it was pretty cool. That that is being dropped into the deep end. Big time. Yeah, and okay. then we went on tour. So we did a national tour of that show. Yep. Um, for about a year. And then I came back and did uh, Brighton Beach Memoirs with Matthew Broderick. Uh, and then we took that on the road. Um, and then I came back and uh, did Whoopi Goldberg's first one woman show with Mike wow. Nichols. So when you, uh, maybe, maybe this happened um, in New York, but I'm guessing you faced it more outside of New York um, because you, you were working with people who eventually figured out who you were in New York. As you took the show on the road and with each new, with each new location had to navigate being really young. And I'm guessing um, given, that you, given that you still look young, you probably looked really young. Um, you know, how, as you That's entered hard. into each new city, how did, you, how did you address that? How did you deal with yeah. that? Yeah, it, it was really, it was, you know, uh, difficult sometimes um, because these are unionized theaters, yeah. um, you know, all, all usually white men um, work there their entire careers and don't tell me what to do, kid. Right. So I just would always ask as nicely as possible, ask their opinions, you know, at, go in a little bit early, say, how do you like to do, you know, how do you like to set up the yeah. scenery and the lights and everything else? Uh, and, you know, just pay them the respect that they were due. And, and that usually worked out pretty well. Wow. Early lessons from those, how, how long were you, were you doing that work in New York and traveling um, early in your career? Uh, about six years. So, wow. um, yeah, along the way, I started to figure out because even though I worked on very successful shows, the right. shows still close, right? Um, you know, and, and so you get good at filing for unemployment, those kinds of things. And, you know, I, d I just start to realize I didn't have a great freelance mentality, which is really yeah. what it took. Um, and that's when I thought, you know, maybe I should transition into something um, uh, a little more solid yep. uh, and decided to go back to Hawaii and uh, got a job at um, Hyatt Resorts. They were opening an incredibly large resort on the big island of Hawaii, um, yeah. 1,500 rooms. And I was the, they decided because I was a Broadway person, they would make me the director of recreation. <laughs> so, and the sort of the feature, sure. right, exactly, <laughs> right. So the feature uh, activity at this particular hotel was um, this dolphin swimming program. Um, which was managed very, very expertly by vet, uh, cetacean veterinarians from Scripps Institute in San Diego. Uh, and anyway, so uh, that was really being thrown into the deep end. <laughs> are, there, are there lessons from that early freelance experience that, um, you know, that stay with you? You're, you're in a very different situation now, obviously. I mean, talk a little bit about that transition, but are there pieces of that attitude that are valuable now? Is it all so far in the back that it's hard to remember? I mean, oh no, uh, yeah, it, the, you know, those were um, just amazing training years for me, mainly on how to deal with people, and you know, and that relationships are are vital uh, and sort of the foundation to get stuff done. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've always in in the in my career trajectory always tried to make sure I had uh, opportunities um, where, you know, it, it really was sort of production. Mm -hmm. So like at, when I was at Columbia, I, and I call it producing commencement. So at Columbia's right. commencement, we take, we used to take the 10 acre quad in the center of the Morningside Heights campus and, and turn it into a 20 seat, 20,000 seat stadium. Um, and so my Broadway stuff carries through all, yeah. all, all the time, which is really great. So I, I knew you a little, or I knew of your career a little bit before coming to Colby Sawyer, but, but, you know, there's a, there's the recent decades, the recent years of your career have been really focused on um, planning, development, facility management, managing people who are managing systems and operations. Um, where did that, your, your, you're the director of recreation at an enormous new, the probably the, I think probably the first kind of big major hotel chain to go onto the Big Island. 
Um, how does that end up putting you in this place where you're managing real estate and people and construction and a lot of moving pieces? Um, is there a is there a short summary of the jump to that? No, it, it's a <laughs> it's just, it's a circuitous journey uh, building. You know, as I went. So a after I worked at the Hyatt, I was recruited by Four Seasons to come to Maui and open their first offshore resort. I ended up working for Four Seasons for almost eight years um, and uh, uh, part of a team that actually helped develop the resort services programs. And so we opened uh, in the Caribbean and, um, you know, getting ready for uh, their big island property to open. So, um, and that was a lot of development and, um, you know, procurement on, uh, on, you know, furniture and all of those kinds of things. And then yeah. I ended up uh, Four Seasons owned and managed the Pierre Hotel in New York, and I ended up coming back to New York to do a large, um, what we call a public space renovation, so lobbies, elevator cars, all of those things. Um, yeah. And so uh, that I, so I was back in New York, very happy to be there, uh, and got a call from a recruiter uh, asking me about, you know, my experience handling difficult people, dot, 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 Broadway actors. Um, uh, and or hotel guests uh, and uh, ended up being this private um, inpatient medical surgical unit at Mount Sinai and they wanted a hotel manager to, to really run it. Um, and that was probably the most circuitous change in my uh, career. Um, I, I didn't even know what people were talking about for the first two years that I worked there. Because it's like, what does otolaryngology mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, um, but I ran it like a hotel and it became very, very successful. And um, so they just kept giving me more, more operation, operational responsibility. Uh, and it, it ultimately grew into a very large operations job. Um, and then that, that sort of launched my career in healthcare. Well, I, because I'm going to anticipate the question, what does otolaryngology mean? Do you, do, do you yeah. have a definition? Ear, ear, no, ear, nose, and throat. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. So the, the real question then is, was that a, was the, 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 the skill sets, you know, seem, the way you described it, that seems understandable. Was there a, was there a real culture shift to that for you? Um, yeah, it, it, it was traumatic almost yeah. because, um, you know, I felt such a fish out of water most administrator, healthcare administrators learn, you know, behind the scenes in an office, in an admissions office, or in medical records, or, you know, in finance or human resources. Uh, and for me, I learned healthcare at the bedside, um, you know, working with nurses, working with the doctors. And uh, it, it was spectacular because I, you know, was really drinking from the fire hose. Um, but I, I feel very fortunate that it happened that way. And, um, you know, I sort of went from the bedside back uh, right. to back of the house, um, but it, it, it was fantastic. As you've, um, your various roles at Columbia after that, and then the Columbia University Medical Center, Harvard, Dartmouth, and, and what you're doing with um, Boston Children's Hospital there, it just, the scale of these, projects that you oversee that are just one part of your job, these big construction projects and then the moving pieces, is it, can you, can you narrow down to, to, to one, you know, what the biggest challenge of your, of, of these kinds of roles that you've had over the last, say, you know, 12, 15 years, is it, are you able to identify what's the most challenging piece of the job or is it just, is part of it just this? Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think you can, you know, like in healthcare, it's really uh, the regulatory environment. You know, it's it's a real challenge. You know, Massachusetts probably has the 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 strictest rules, if you will, just to sort of state it simply, uh, to to actually get approval to build something. Mm -hmm. um, but the the secret is surrounding yourself with people smarter than you. Yeah. You know um, that because uh, there's no way you can know everything. So let's go get the, the absolute best construction manager that, uh, you know, in the United States of America to come and work with us so that um, he or 
she can can do that work mm -hmm. you know mostly how do i expedite things how do i how do i uh you know remove barriers for people um and then you know ultimately con conduct the orchestra when and make sure everything's humming along and um you know i i just find that incredibly satisfying yeah are there um there must be you've hinted at this a little bit but there must be some early lessons from the time at colby sawyer being the house manager the early day the 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 existence on Broadway that you went through that come up for you now and then where you just think, okay, this is, this is not that much different. And here's how I'm going to deal with this person, this problem, whatever that might be. Yeah. I, and you know, you could think of multiple examples, you know, like I was stage managing Whoopi was doing her show and, you know, for the most part, she's on stage the whole time. There was no intermission in that show. And um, there was some clatter downstairs in the basement. So I went downstairs to figure out what was going on. All of a sudden, all the lights went out in the entire house. And so I'm trying to run back upstairs and it's a circular staircase and she's like, hello, hello. <laughs> and so, you know, and it was like, how do we get the lights back on? Um, and, you know, she just, uh, the audio didn't go out though, which was great. So she was just cracking the audience up while we scrambled to get the power back on. So. You know, um, and that's probably like one in a million examples, but it, it's just being, you know, as as calm and uh, just thinking through, you yeah. know, how do you solve this problem as fast as possible. And, and the audience was not all holding a flashlight in their hand that they could suddenly no. use. This was 1984. You, you, so. were running up, you were running up and down a circular staircase with no lights. Correct. Problem. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah iPhones wow. were still were still a blink in Steve Jobs' eye. So, <laughs> wow. Um, hey, the last year, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna shift a little bit to Colby Sawyer, but before we do that, I want to talk specifically about um, your work at Children's Hospital. You know, the last year with the pandemic has has layered in all sorts of challenges for all sorts of reasons. But you. Um, you know, you work at the intersection of, of education and research, healthcare delivery. You also manage real estate, and I'm sure are dealing. You mentioned the regulatory environment around healthcare in Massachusetts, but you're in the city of Boston. I mean, and I, I know you're in other communities outside of Boston. Um, has the last year with the pandemic, it, it must have created. Um, complications for the the real estate part of your job and the intersection with what the hospital is trying to accomplish has it has it driven costs up has it slowed down what you're managing has it caused stress on the hospital as you've tried to figure out how to manage that all of the above yeah so um we actually had to shut down so we had two very large projects one right. is our new clinical tower uh, part of the Longwood campus. Um, that's a billion dollar building. Um, we have new facility in Brookline uh, that was under construction. So both of those, even though we could have gotten an exemption, uh, so Boston said, and the state said, if you're, if you're built, if you have an essential project, which healthcare is considered, um, you can keep going. Uh, but we did, we decided to stop for about nine weeks. And because we just wanted to make sure we had all the safety protocols in place um, yeah. because uh, you know construction workers particularly were uh, had a higher incidence of uh, COVID positivity. So we we took our time. We put all of the you know the symptom attestations in place, the PPE, um, and and we we had to use less people on the job because they needed to socially distance. So, um, so it delayed our projects, the big project by about eight months, um, Brookline just about three months. Um, but yeah, and that, that's just, you know, that's just on the, the large construction side. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I, I will, as we're going through some other questions, I'll invite the audience. Um, you're welcome to put questions into the, into the Q and A or chat if they come up. And you know, if it's relevant to the current topic, we'll, we'll definitely take it on if we can. And if not, I, I've got some questions that folks submitted beforehand, and we'll also just try to come back to anything that, that's in the chat as we're, as we're moving along. Um, you are the chair of the board of trustees at Colby Sawyer. And as I said to somebody earlier today, I'm interviewing and being recorded interviewing my boss's boss. And so this is, you know, um, that, you know, the, uh, 
the pandemic has, people have, I'm sure, read in the media all the challenges that in different ways that have hit co uh, colleges and, and universities around the country. Um, as we went through making decisions at Colby Sawyer last March, and uh, you know we were in the thick of it here in New London, um, how, what did that mean for you from month to month, from week to week, as you, I, I know that you talk with Sue and have a regular, I, I always know what time your regular meeting with, with her is on during the weeks and you know when you're gonna be talking with her. But as, as you were communicating with President Stubner and the senior leadership team was working through things, we had a, we had a board meeting last May, we you know um, just about six, eight weeks into to navigating all of this. Um, if you can remember last May in that board meeting, um, what were you most worried about? What were you thinking about at that time? Everyone's safety, yeah. bottom, bottom line. You yeah. know, how do we keep students safe? How do we keep faculty, staff safe? Um, you know, the new London community and the broader community, Son of P Valley community yeah. safe. So, um, and, you know, I felt like I, I was in a good place because, you know, just being in the thick of operations at Boston Children's yeah. and, and, you know, really the science of the, of the virus and really yeah. understanding, um, you know, how uh, public health and infectious disease people were thinking about it. So I felt, um, you know, like I, I, could, I could really help um, Sue and, and the entire team. And, you know, and, and the board was, you know, laser focused on, you know, how, how do we make sure everybody stays safe, everybody gets uh, the, the right technology. Um, we knew the faculty were um, super stressed mm -hmm. on having to teach remotely, you know, uh, really the flip of a switch. Um, but I would say this community has just done an amazing job, um, uh, you know, with under Sue's leadership um, and and faculty really just bending over backwards to be able to teach in multiple mo modes, um, and the students really, you know, also stepping up and and. Uh, uh, Ninety-five percent doing the right thing. You know, a couple of incidents here and there, but no, no college or university went, you know, untouched by this. So um, I, I'm just incredibly proud with with how um, how the the college really managed this. Yeah, that's great. That's a really helpful vision. It it does it it prompts me to step back from the the present moment in time, and maybe this is the question I should have should have asked first. Sometimes. And I'm, I don't have a good answer for this all the time. So I'm interested to hear what your answer is. Sometimes students in particular will say to me, what, what do the trustees do? Like what, what's, what's a trustee? <laughs> do, you, do you have a good answer for that question? What, what is, what's a trustee and, and what do they do? Yeah, I do actually. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, I think board structures and governance, um, particularly in higher education and, and academic medicine, um, are, are the, you know, the collective brain trust to make sure that the, the, the safety of the community, the financial viability and sustainability of, of these institutions are maintained and can thrive. Yeah. Uh, and during a, you know, a massive crisis like a once in a century pandemic, um, that's, I think, when boards well, they sort of make or break themselves. Uh, I would say the Colby Sawyer board made itself even that much more, uh, um, uh, not successful, but everybody was, you know, just so giving of their time and what else can we do? And, and you know, and I think to everybody's surprise, we even raised more money. Right. Um, I, I know, you know, even development people at Children's and, you know, at the Ivies, everybody was panicked, like, oh, my God, what's going to happen to our, our targets? And it was overwhelming, I think, uh, across the board, how well, it, and, you know, just people open their pockets, yeah. which was sensational. Yeah, yeah. Um, as in the, in the roles that you're in, um, you you answer to boards and present to them and work with boards at you know all the places you've been in the last 15 20 years 
um, as chair of the board, does how, how does that shape how you behave as a trustee? I mean, how not to yell at staff. <laughs> <laughs> be patient listen <laughs> I, yeah i presented in front of some very tough customers and uh, particularly one particularly at dartmouth who you know dan um uh, but no you know no names obviously not um no i think you know um the the um, right amount of detail and information and in what sort of rhythm or cadence do, does that information get shared and um you know what what i was laughing with sue this morning because um you know understanding the bright line between a fiduciary uh and a board member versus management and letting management really do what it's there to do and not not sort of step on toes um and, um, you know, I, I think I, I watched trustees who said, you know, were very micromanagers and said, this is how you need to do it. And, you know, they misunderstand their role if, if that's what starts to happen. So um, I, I, learning from the other side, I feel like I try to be uh, as uh, conscious about that since I'm in operations on a daily basis, I, I have to sometimes say to Sue, now if I, I put my toe in the water too much, just push me back. So. Um, but I, I think that that's that's been a, a big lesson for me over the last 15 years working with some some pretty high powered boards. That's great. That's great. And I think it's a, a you know, the success of this past year in terms of decision making that the, the board has been involved in. It's a it's a really good uh, as a board, you you set a good tone for one another and, and not getting into the weeds, not getting into management decisions, but but setting setting the priorities and and then and then holding us accountable. I think it's a really uh, it's impressive to and then as you said during a crisis, that's when you learn whether you've been behaving the right way or not and whether it's working. Yeah, I will I will uh, apologize to the audience. I put myself on mute for a second because as I warned Lisa, sometimes the pipes in my office bang on these days where the temperature changes a lot, and so that's happening now. So um, we'll just hopefully it won't be too loud. It'll be fine. We'll use it as a as a fundraising opportunity to right. say that we need more money so that we can fix the the heating systems at Colby Sawyer. <laughs> so we have we have, we had a couple of questions that came in by email first, and then we've got a couple of questions in the in the Q and A here online. And um, uh, Tom Tom Keeley, one of our our deans here on campus, uh, was just following up on the your comment about the Longwood campus. And he says, the Longwood campus is an interesting site, mix of residential, housing, got medical institutions. Uh, and he's wondering if you've had to deal with alleviating the local, concer local concerns about medical research that happens in the neighborhood and particularly, you know, right there in your cluster, there's a lot of, a lot of research. Do people raise concerns about the impact or potential dangers from that? Um, I think in the early days, uh, in the 60s and 70s, when the what we describe now as the Longwood Medical Area, which is sort of its own district, it is probably the densest um, healthcare research uh, uh, square mile in the country. And, and um, you know, when I moved from New York uh, to come to Harvard, I uh, got a tour of Harvard Medical School thinking, you know, New Yorkers do it best. They, nobody can do it better than them. And I went to the LMA and, and my jaw dropped. I, I was just so blown away. But I think the, you know, the transparency that the institutions really needed to bring um, to the local community about what it was that they were actually doing on the research side, that, that improved dramatically in the 80s and 90s. You know, all of a sudden we had things called websites, so you could actually you could actually post um, the types of research that you were doing. You know, there's been huge pressure to eliminate research on um, non-human primates, and so that's also happened, um, and that's that's done very sparingly now, and only in particular areas around the country. So. Um, you know, I think uh, I think the community now is very proud uh, of the collaboration and partnerships um, that they they advocated for and deserved. Um, is there more that we can do? Always, um, you know. I think uh, climate change and um, particularly communities of color uh, that are greatly impacted by you know pollutants that are in the air and 
and you know traffic and all of that stuff um, hopefully we can really start to to you know grapple with that and actually make change uh you know over these next five to ten years that's an excellent um, question your, by the way. your trusty colleague tom hoyt apparently has heard a story about having to coordinate flying large steel beams with transport helicopters through downtown Boston. Um, and uh, he, he just wants to say that that sums up how crazy your job is, but I think he also wants you to relate a little bit of that story if, if you can. Well, sure. Um, we, we actually, well, two, two, option, two options there. We actually um, uh, worked with our neighbor, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, our new clinical tower was in the flight path of their helipad, which we share with them. So the, the helicopters land on a building at the Brigham and sometimes they have pediatric uh, trauma cases and they come over a bridge to children's or their actual Brigham patients. And so we actually had to build a new helipad together where we, uh, on top of one of their tallest buildings, so it would be out of the way of our building. And um, so we flew in the steel to do that. Um, and then the other piece, the other project we did was um, we actually built a 900, a 290 foot bridge that connects from our patient family garage over Longwood Avenue uh, directly into the hospital. And that was in three span sections, uh, took about eight months. Um, and we only had to close Longwood Avenue down uh, for one weekend. Wow. Wow. And that is, um... It is a busy place. <laughs> so yeah, we had to reroute buses and yeah. you know emergency vehicles, and it, it was yeah nine months of planning to, to close down for one weekend. Wow! So we have uh, I think it's a student, an anonymous student, um, who I'm I'm not sure if you've got practical on the ground suggestions for this, but uh, what would you suggest to someone who wants to work as a nurse in oncology at Boston Children's Hospital when they graduate? Uh, we would be so fortunate to have a Colby Sawyer uh, nursing grad come and work at Boston Children's. I wish we had more. Um, and so hopefully with our push to increase enrollment in the health sciences uh, and nursing, um, the, the amount of, of retirements that will take place over the next three to five years in nursing specifically uh, as well, and partially because that's, um, you know, nurses are ready to age out and, and to get well-deserved retirement, but they're also exhausted from the pandemic. So we think the numbers are gonna be uh, quite large with the amount of people leaving the nursing practice um, and profession. And so we, to, we, we would be fortunate to have Colby Sawyer nursing grads come to work at Children's. Great. We had a, we had a senior- and, and, and if they do, they should please send me their email so I can welcome them when they come. Great. Uh, we had a senior who sent us a question when he uh, when he RSVP'd, and um, the first he he asked it's just sort of a follow up. If you've got tips for graduating seniors in general, just um, you know, as they're as they're leaving uh, this very small community, are there are there big general pieces of advice you give to folks to think about um, to avoid missteps or just to take advantage of opportunities? Yeah, you know, um, especially coming out of the pandemic, you know, nobody's been able to have any fun, really. Um, and so if you can't afford to do it, you know, why not take the summer off and, uh, and travel if you can, obviously safely, um, and get started in the fall, if that works for your circumstance. Um, and, and if not, you know, depending on where you where, where your next opportunity is, whether it's grad school or, or a new job, um, you know, to, to really sort of enjoy the location that you're moving to. Great. His, his other question was about Colby Sawyer and the board. Just if there are um, significant changes that you see as the board chair um, coming for the college in the next five years or coming for the board in, in terms of its structure in the next five years. Uh, yeah, look, I'll take the last one first. Um, I think, you know, o over the last five years, the, the realization of uh, a balanced set of skills and experience um, are, are really needed. You know, I think um, 
it's not just about having somebody come on the board who's got deep pockets and can write a check. I mean, we need other types of contributions like, you know, people who have been in financial services, people who have been in healthcare, people who have been in higher education. Uh, and I think we've started to develop an, a lovely balance between very, very dedicated alumni um, who also, you know, somebody like me, who's an alum uh, who comes from healthcare and higher ed, um, you know, I, I can bring a lot to the table because of that. And so I think the constant calibration of the right um, skill mix is, is vital, uh, especially for the next, you know, five to 10 years uh, as we've pivoted towards more health sciences and uh, nursing and our amazing collaboration with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. Um, and so as we follow those trends in, in higher education, you know, what, what's either missing on the board um, from an experience standpoint, or um, uh, is it, it, you know, somebody's leaving. And so like, like we're losing the fantastic Pete Volonakis who has just brought so much uh, just wisdom and generosity and, you know, and tough love. Uh, to the Colby Sawyer board, uh, to lose somebody like him is a big deal. So how do how do we really think about replacing pieces of skill that that Pete brought to to the board? Great. Um, I, I don't know if you are seeing the questions and answers box that are coming in. So this one puts you a little bit on the spot. You, I think the short answer is probably going to be yes because you you've got to say yes to this. Um, and I hope I don't mispronounce anybody's name. I know a couple of the folks in this. Mary Druding, Nancy Sullivan, Sully, Jen Ellis, uh, and Amy Carrier all say hello and would like to thank you for sharing floor space in your New York City apartment for New Year's Eve in Times Square around 1982. The question is, is there any chance that you remember that? And the only right answer is yes, you remember it. But go ahead, do you remember that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it was the only time that I actually went to Times Square. Well, that's not true. Uh, I went one other time because I was doing a show and it got out at, at 11.30 and I had to go through the square. But yeah, it was a, was a fantastic weekend, as I recall. <laughs> that's great, that's great. We, we had another question that had been sent in by email. Um, that really was about more about the real estate piece of your job and managing property. Um, and uh, it's from one of our staff members here on campus, just with the changing real estate situations in, in cities um, post COVID, um, particularly Boston. I mean, we've got a lot, we've got a fair number of graduates who, who moved to Boston. Uh, we've got a lot of alumni in Boston. Um, as we come out of this, are there, regulatory and um, kind of zoning and planning issues that, that are coming up for you as, a, as an enormous property holder and developer that, that weren't in place before COVID? Do you anticipate that you know, people are gonna, are gonna be confronted with more, um, I don't know, with, just, with, with more uh, challenges and, and regulation? No, I don't think the regulation, I mean, I think everybody, I think there's a much deeper understanding in, in um, private development in large cities about zoning's impact on um, neighborhoods, primarily with people of color mm -hmm. and the negative impact that's had for the last 50 to 70 years. Yeah, I think uh, so. That's one thing. And I think, um, you know, the city of Boston has been working on that uh, very, very seriously. Um, sort of on the other side, on the market side, it, you know, the office market has taken a beating because everybody's working from home. And so that will come back, but probably not to the level that it, it, it ha had been or ever yeah. will be. And so how do you really think about those assets? And does some of that get converted to residential? Um, yeah. You know, I think what, what didn't slow down one bit is the laboratory uh, life sciences, biomedical, pharma development, both in Kendall Square and in Cambridge and in Boston, uh, particularly in the Fenway now. And so, um, so there will be significant growth in um, uh, develop uh, lab buildings um, because Kendall Square is sort of out of space. And so it's shifting to Watertown, it's shifting to the Fenway, it's shifting to the seaport. The other yeah. thing is we need more residential so that, uh, an affordable residential. 
So I'm working with a developer out of the UK. Um, in Europe, they have mainly built um, graduate student uh, dormitories or apartment buildings, and uh, they've wanted to come to the US market. And so they're doing three buildings in Boston. One of them is on a piece of property that we own. They're small micro apartments, fully furnished uh, and at much more reasonable prices. So, you know, sort of that, the, the term is live, play, work. Right. And so you can you can actually live in Boston, afford to live in Boston, walk to work, and be surrounded by you know hopefully coming back great restaurants and lots yeah. lots of uh, outdoor activities. So yeah. those are sort of the three. So office is soft. Resi needs to come back in a big way, and labs rule Boston. <laughs> Well, you you anticipated the second half of her question, which was basically that she'd heard that for um, residential opportunities and startup businesses that there there's some flex now and some opportunity because office traditional office space maybe isn't being used in the same way. Before we came on live, you mentioned that in some of your projects, um, not just in not just in the building projects, but just managing staff and thinking about teams at Children's. You all are have to, having to rethink the work schedule and workplace a little bit and whether somebody occupies an office space that is their office space or they come, they come to a desk that maybe on Tuesdays and Thursdays somebody else is using. Are you, as an organization, you must be starting to take that on right now. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, uh, and, and, you know, space is so, so important to people. It, it, it sort of is, you know, especially for physicians, you know, to be yeah. able to hang their diplomas and yeah. all of their accolades is very important to them culturally. And yeah. so how do we start to shift away from, we can either make space smaller because it, it's just so expensive um, yeah. or can it become much more flexible? And I think that's just, that's going to take a while for people to get comfortable with, particularly in, in more traditional businesses like healthcare, academic healthcare, higher education. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a big expense. And so, you know, we, we have about um, 500,000 square feet of office that we lease uh, at Children's and, you know, it's, it's been occupied maybe five to 10% over the last yeah. 13 months. And, you know, it costs us about $25 million a year. So it's very expensive. And so- And uh, people are still productive because- Oh, at home. We, I can, mean, do, we can do this. Right. Absolutely. We yeah. even set up our radiologists at <laughs> home with, you know, high res resolution monitors and they, and, and virtual care, which again, we had to flip the switch, just like faculty at Colby Sur had to overnight start teaching remotely. We started to treat patients because Massachusetts was one of five states that still didn't reimburse for virtual care. We flipped the switch. We, we were doing about 30 virtual visits a day. We went from 30 to 4,000 in a day. And so, um, you know, so even even physicians and nurse practitioners um, started to treat patients, you know, from their basements or their dining room tables. So yeah. um, I think we've learned a huge amount. And so I think most for the most part, people will love the flexibility. And if you you know, if you live nine miles outside of Boston, it usually takes you an hour and a half to get into town. Right. So not, you know, getting that commuting time back, I think, has been very, very valuable for people. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 got a it's an enormous it has to be an enormous impact, and and for you in leadership, just figuring out okay, so what will this look like as we as we come back to whatever this this next phase is and what this looks like. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're we're close to the end here, and um, I know having sat in your chair that it's tiring to do this for almost an hour. So I just want to say to the audience, if there are any questions that you want to put into the chat or the Q and A. In the next minute or two, uh, please do. Pretty soon, Tracy will come on and interrupt us and and close things up. Um, you mentioned uh, in in response to an earlier question, you talked a little bit about the Dartmouth Hitchcock relationship and um, you know kind of where we are with with that now. Um, what look out a few years. Um, how does that evolve? What, you know, what, what do you see from your seat as a board chair about the decisions that faculty are making right now, the work that is happening, not just in the School of Nursing and Health Sciences, but in the other schools as well, as we, as we think about these different intersections? Um, you know, 
are there are there particular places you see that going and really changing or veering? What what happens next with that relationship? You know, I, I think it just builds. Uh, I think it uh, a lot of it depends on uh, DH's uh, long term strategic plan. I, I I know they've been trying to merge with um, a system out of Ma Manchester, um, and so. You know, they're already the largest um, healthcare system in New Hampshire. This will make them even larger. You know, uh, the opportunity is for us to, um, you know, graduate an incredible uh, Colby Soros students who want to go to work for them. Um, but but I think, you know, there, there are also other institutions, you know, the hospitals in Boston are uh, always looking for, you know, that we carry vacancy rates that are, just uh, you know, really hard to manage because, um, and I think with the turnover in in nursing and and other uh, health professions, there'll be so many job opportunities. So I think for the arts and sciences, um, social sciences, uh, business uh, administration, I think you know, I think Colby Sur does an amazing job in um, certainly with the local uh, businesses and corporations for internships and, and you know, actual placements post-graduation. Um, but, you know, I think looking around the entire New England uh, region it is, you know, there, there's, um, there's nothing but upside for Colby Sawyer. Great. And those, play, you know, outside of the DH system, those, those other organizations are facing the same, the same cliff we all keep talking about in terms of healthcare retirements. Um, whether it's whether it's you know your organization, the the, uh, the Mass General affiliated hospitals in Boston, we, we have particularly nurses, but there are other folks in these in these care fields that um, in the next five to ten years we're going to lose an awful lot of folks who retire because of of how demanding it's been. <laughs> well, okay, and you too. So Somebody maybe about my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, and, and higher ed and, and healthcare, one of the reasons I, I decided to stay and not, you know, jump to yet one more industry is the the variation of jobs is yeah. so broad. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, at, at Harvard, you know, we, we had everything from a piano tuner to, you know, the dean of Harvard uh, business school. So right. the variability is so fantastic. So you could work your way through an institution and get, you know, just have a very fulfilling career by, by, you know, moving around and doing different things. Yeah. And you, I mean, you started in the hospitality industry, really doing hospitality and transitioned that into f facilities and development of new facilities, design. And now, you know, you've built this career out of, out of, managing the, the development of real estate facilities, pro major projects and constructions and systems. Um, that's a great, it's really, a, it's a nice advertisement for a Colby Sawyer education and this kind of approach, right? Sure. Learn how to solve some problems, learn how to be patient and, and polite to people. And, and it goes, it goes a long way. <laughs> yeah. If you can run a dolphin swimming program, you can, uh, you can probably build a 600,000 square foot uh, clinical building. <laughs> well, Lisa, as we as we come to the end here, I just want to let you know, we've got folks um, weighing in in the chat, um, just saying that they really appreciate hearing about your career and all you've done, you know, in the last, uh, you know, since you graduated from here. We've got uh, somebody who's a, who's a, 70, a graduate from 77 who, um, I just want to read this to you in case you can't see it. I loved to I loved to dance and would go to the, she was a medical assisting uh, major. I loved to dance and go to the dance studio in my lab coat. Um, went on from here to, I think, Northeastern for medical technology. Her first job was at Children's Hospital and in the hematology lab. And there's just a nice, you know, just a real, a lot of um, really nice comments here about how much people have appreciated hearing about your, your work at, in your professional life, but also what you're doing here at Colby Sawyer as board chair. And, um, you know, you've had to make some hard decisions in the last few years and be, you've been on the board through through really important pivot points. And um, I think it's clear people are um, people are, are grateful for that. So we've got some good some good conversations going on here in, in the discussion. So 
Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna invite Tracy to come back to tell us if there's anything we need to to say before we close up. And as we say uh, goodbye to folks, she I know has been watching these great comments in the chat as well. So um, I'm sure uh, she will join me in thanking those of you who've who are having a back and forth conversation with one another in the chat. It's great to see this these connections happening. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Lisa, on behalf of all of us here at the college and everyone in the audience, just thank you so much for taking this time out of your busy, busy schedule. It was fascinating to learn about your career and certainly insightful to learn about the role of the Board, board of Trustees and um, the work that you're doing with all of your trustee colleagues um, to keep this great college going and in good standing. And so we're so grateful for all that you and your trustee colleagues do. For everyone in the audience, again, thanks so much for taking time from your day to join us and to um, hear from Lisa. Uh, do watch your email box. As I mentioned earlier, we will be sending the recording of today's session um, as well. We you know, will be sharing information about future events and hopefully very, very soon, they won't all be virtual. We'll be back together with all of you again and we'll be able to travel throughout the country to see all of you in your hometowns. Um, so be watching for all of that. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you all very soon. Thank Bye -bye. you. Really Thanks everybody. Take care. Take care.